Jay and I are going to talk about path planning today. So our presentation really picks up off of what Basti talked about. Um, so what we want to talk about in this one is we want to show the story of the development and progression of motion planning algorithms. Um, we want to continue on and show like from where Basti left off what's happened until now. We want to talk about some of the newer algorithms, their advantages and disadvantages when they're useful. Um, we also want to introduce you to some tools that you can use, such as Open Motion Planning Library that you could then use in the future to quickly implement many of these algorithms and even some of the newest ones as they come out. And then we want to give you some hands-on experience with this um, library. So as an outline, we're first going to review what Basti went over. Um, then I'm going to go through FMT star, informed RT star, bit star, and rabbit star. And then from there, that's when Jay is going to take over and talk about OMPL and talk about the exercises. So what Basti went over in his presentation, he talked about the path planning problem for autonomous flying robots. He talked about the problem itself, the abstractions that we can choose for it, and the different approaches we can take. Um, we talked about several, alg several algorithms for this, um, and then the idea of using multiple at once as ensembles. And then we talked about how, depending on the environment, there are different planners that may work better than others, and you have to choose those accordingly. Um, specifically, we talked about A star, grid search. We talked about RRT star, and then a little bit about chomp. So just as a review, um, so graph search methods for path planning, they use dynamic programming. They find an exact solution to the discrete problem that you chose. So you have to take your problem and discretize it in some manner um, to, in order to use these algorithms. Um, so some good things about them is they are resolution complete meaning that for a high enough resolution, you will find a solution, if there is one. And then they're resolution optimal, meaning that for that given resolution, the, the path given is the optimal path. And then some of them, such as A star, are optimally efficient. And so some of the cons with these methods, though, is um, the quality of your path when you take that into con continuous space um, it greatly is dependent on the discretization that you chose. So meaning if you have a really high discretization, it's going to be very similar to your continuous path. But if you take something that's very low resolution, it may not translate well to an actual path. Um, and the other problem with these algorithms is they suffer when you go to really high dimensional spaces because of this curse of dimensionality. And then kind of the other side um, is the sampling-based methods, which came um, the development came because of the downsides of these graph-based methods. And so some of the great things about them is there's no discretization because they sample from this continuous state space. Um, they scale well in higher dimensions. They are probabilistically complete, which means that as the number of samples they take goes towards infinity, the probability that you will find a solution is one. Um, they also have any time resolution, meaning that the longer you run these algorithms, the higher resolution your solution will be, um, which is great because in some cases you may have a long time that you can plan a path and you'll get something that's very high resolution, but then you can also just use them for a short amount of time to get some sort of path that may not be the best, but it's usable. Um, and then they can be asymptotically optimal, like RT star, meaning that, again, the longer you run them or as the number of samples tends to infinity, the probability that the path you get is optimal goes towards one. Um, however, there are some downsides to these sampling-based methods too, which is that when you're random sampling, it can just take a long time to compute and just continue to take these random samples. Um, and some more details about sampling-based methods. There are two different, there are distinctions between them. So you have multiple query method, which is where you take a bunch of samples at once, you take a batch essentially, and then you create a graph from that batch of samples, which you can call roadmap in some planners. Um, what's nice about this is you can have multiple start and ending pairs. And some examples are given on this slide, but we won't really go into depth on those. Um, and then you also have the single query methods, such as like RT, where you're doing one sample at a time, and you have one start and end location. So now kind of the question comes like, where, where's this timeline? Where are we in this timeline? What's happened from where we left off? So, to give some perspective, we have the Dijkstra's algorithm for that one, which was in 1956, A star in 1968, RT 1998, RT star 2010, and then we have Chomp in 2013. 
Um, so what's happened since then? The first one we're going to talk about is FMT STAR, which stands for Fast Marching Tree. And what's great about this planner is it combines the benefits of the multiple and single query algorithms. Um, it takes a batch of samples in the continuous space, and then it's able to search in that graph um, using lazy dynamic programming um, and search through that set to find the path. And so this leads to a solution that's asymptotically optimal, and but it's faster than RT star and PRM star. And what's great is because it, it builds out incrementally from the start location, whereas like RT star, you're sampling anywhere in the space. And so you may get points that are really far away versus close. Um, whereas with this one, it's only doing the ones that are the, the next step in the tree that's building. Um, and what's great about this is it means you never have to backtrack in your tree to do a rewiring, which Vasky talked about, because that's computationally inefficient. It takes a lot of time. Um, so yeah, it's better than RT star because it creates connections near optimally. There's no rewiring. And then it's better than PRM star which is a batch-based or graph-based method um, because it builds this path in a tree-like structure um, rather than it just being sort of random in directions. Um, and so when there's no obstacles, the solution that's given is exactly the same as our PRM star, but it's faster in finding that solution. Um, but really what FMT star was built for was um, environments where there's a high density of obstacles and that's where it really shines. So just a quick run through of how this works with FMT star. Um, so you have a batch of samples. Let's see, I'll turn my pointer. You have a batch of samples, which are these points, these nodes. Um, and so it finds first the lowest cost node that is V open. So V open are the gray dots, which are sort of like the edges of this tree. And it selects one. And then it looks within a radius for those that are unvisited, which are the white ones. And then it selects one. So in this case, that's labeled as X. And then it finds all the nodes in the radius that are V open or the gray ones. And it selects the ones that's the, the minimum amount of cost. And if that is collision free, that edge, it then adds it to the tree. And after it's looped through all of these V unvisited nodes, it now classifies those as V open. And the one that was V open is now V closed. And you can, so you can see how it just incrementally works out. Um, so here you can see an example after 100 edges, 1,000 edges, and then 2,500 edges. OK, so some of the results with this. Um, so in two dimensions, it performs very similar, similarly to RRT star and PRM star. And where it really starts to shine is as you increase the amount of dimensions. So here's with 7D. Um, we have a comparison of average cost versus execution time, average cost and execution time. Um, but this is with 50% obstacles versus zero obstacles. Um, and where it really, you can see the differences in 10 dimensions where PRM star couldn't even find a solution because it took too long. Um, and then you see it compared to RRT star where it's much faster and finds better solutions quicker. So with these planners that we've talked about so far, the next question would be, how can we improve them? So one thing that we can look at is with a lot of these, like for, this graph on the right, this is with RRT star path planning. You can see that it's solving for paths in every single point in this search space. So it's finding an optimal path to every single one of those places, but that's really unnecessary for most applications. Because um, in most cases, for our applications, we really know where we want to go, and we really just need a solution connecting those two states. Um, so if we could not solve for all of these other paths that are unnecessary, that could greatly reduce the computation time. So this leads to the next development of informed RRT star. And what this one does is it's essentially the same as RRT star, but once it finds its first solution, so like in this graph, it found a solution, it then limits its search down to a smaller subproblem or smaller area, which is defined by this um, n-dimensional ellipse. And then, excuse me, when it finds the next best solution, it narrows down that search even more. And so in this case, if there are no obstacles whatsoever, it actually narrows down to a complete line. And so here's a comparison with just normal RRT star versus informed RRT star. And you have, oops, you have CPU time versus the solution cost. And you can see how the informed RRT star essentially plummets with its solution cost, um, whereas RRT star takes a long time to find a comparable cost solution. 
And there, here are some more side-by-side -side comparisons. With the one on the left, it's specifically where you have an obstacle with a small, narrow passageway. And this one, they were saying, seeing how long it took for the planners to find that passageway, which gives an optimal, optimal solution. And with RT star, it took 12.3 seconds, whereas with informed RT star, it only took four seconds. And then in this case on the right, it's just trying to find a way around the obstacle, but um, it just takes a much longer time for RT star to really hug that obstacle, whereas RT star can really focus in and on, on it. So then the next thing would be, how can we take the benefits of RT star and informed RT star and combine that with FMT star, which has that really good speed boost? Um, here on the right, you can see this graph of sort of the development. So we have RRT star, which has one sample for every batch, and it keeps sampling. Whereas we have FMT star, which just at one time takes one batch. Um, so it can't increase its resolution of the path over time. And then that lead to, led to this next planner, which is called BITSTAR, which stands for Batch Informed Trees. And what it does is it tries to kind of find the sweet spot in between these two where it uses batches to increase the speed um, of the planner, but it also is able to resample batches to then increase the resolution um, of its solution. Um, yes, yeah, so it has any time resolution. And then it also limits its search space in a similar way to informed RRT star, um, but differently as I'll show. Um, so again, it uses batches of random samples, and these random samples define an implicit random geometric graph, um, which is essentially creates these implicit edges based on a radius, which is this equation here, which is how it's defined. And then it uses this heuristic to search the RRGG in order to find decreasing solution quality. So here's the overview of how this works. So first, you take a batch of um, samples, and then you have your search is limited actually to this ellipse right here. And this ellipse will increase over time and keep looking at these new samples that lie within that ellipse and it increases until it finds a solution. Once that solution is found, it removes all of these states that were outside of this ellipse um, and also paths that, let, that were going outside. And then it starts over by taking another batch of samples. So you can see the density of these points increases. And then it narrows down that ellipse again and expands outward until it finds another solution. And this can repeat for infinite time and keep refining its solution. So here's sort of a step-by-step -step where we can see again, you can see how it expands out into building its tree. In this case, it doesn't see that narrow passageway, um, but then it gets around the edges of the obstacle and it's able to here find the path, which is the pink path. And then the next step, you'll see the density increases. It removes all those states. You can see, I guess this one, you can't see the path trimmed, but um, and then it starts again with a smaller ellipse and expands outward. And in this case, it finds its way through the passageway, selects that solution. And then you see your, here, you'll see where all these paths are then trimmed between the two. And so now it only has to search a small area and increase the resolution within that area. Some other benefits of BitStar that they um, included to make this even better is one is the true edge cost isn't it calculated right off the bat? So what it does is when it's comparing um, the points, it first says, could this um, increase or decrease the cost of my solution by just using some sort of heuristic like Euclidean distance, but it ignores um, the obstacle first. And if it passes that check, then it goes on to estimate the cost by looking at the collisions or the differential constraints. Um, but by doing that, it's able to eliminate those costly computations um, and it actually adds a lot of benefit. So here we see side-by-side -side comparisons of RRT star, informed RRT star, FMT star, and bit star. And in this test, each of these planners were run until they had a comparable solution. And here you'll see um, that bit star had the lowest time, 0 .3, 0 0.038. And then next we have FMT star, and then informed RRT star, and then RT star. Um, and you can see just when you look at how many points in space it even had to search, it's just so many fewer than these other ones, which had to have such high density of search to space before it found a comparable solution. 
So here's an example with a 14 degree of freedom manipulator. So this is two arms. And they found using BitStar that it was almost twice as likely to find a solution in the allotted amount of time, which is two and a half minutes in this case. And they found that the solution cost was equal to or better than those of the other planners. So now from here with BitStar, you would say, what's the next step? What's the next thing you do to improve this? Um, and when we look at these advancements in these algorithms previously, you found that they always are trying to leverage the strengths of different methods together, sort of like ensemble planning um, to really make the one better as a whole. So then with BitStar, the question would be, what could be improved? What needs to be better? Um, and in this case, we look at with narrow passages, they're just difficult to sample. And so this shift that you see on the bottom, you can see it's trying over and over again to find the sample. And this one, it does have a limited amount of time that's allowed to search, um, but it's it rarely finds that passageway. So this leads to rabbit star, I think is how you say it. Um, and this is some work actually from the lab here with Sanjivan and Basti and others. Um, and what this does is it takes bit star and then it adds with it a local search method, in this case, CHOMP, to refine these samples, to find small passageways or find, um, find ways around obstacles so that it's not having to resample as many times. So how this works is first, it's like normal BitStar, um, and it does its um, cost heuristic estimate. And if it finds, okay, this segment, so in this case, this segment right here, they said this could potentially reduce the cost of our path. At that point, it then passes that over to CHOMP and it optimizes that path. So in this case, it was able to avoid this obstacle. And then it takes that and it compares it to the straight line segment and says, is the CHOMP method better? And in this case, it was because it was going through an obstacle and then adds that new segment to the tree. And this continues on as bit star. Um, and we see with this method, so on the bottom, you can see comparisons with 1.2 seconds. When you compare BitStar with RabbitStar, they're very comparable. Um, but where RabbitStar really shines again is when it's in higher dimensional spaces. When they're in lower dimensional spaces, they're very similar. Um, here we can see some results. This is in um, two-dimensional space. And BitStar is the blue and RabbitStar is the green. And you can see this is runtime versus success rate. And they're similar kind of batched in there. Um, but in this case, when you look at BitStar, when you see medium solution, median solution cost versus time, BitStar does outperform RabbitStar. But then when you jump to, this is now eight dimensions. Again, they're similar with success rate, uh, but we see how RabbitStar does outperform BitStar by having um, lower solution cost versus time. So then from there, I think, so RabbitStar was 2016. Um, I'm not going to talk about this next one. This one came out in February of this year, which is a bit star. And this one's the newest one. This was in 2020 and it uses the latest um, graph search techniques to balance exploration and exploitation of bit star. Um, and it's supposed to perform much better. All right, so here I'll hand off to Jay. Actually, uh, one, one thing maybe I just want to add is I think there's still a, a lot of open questions for rabbit star. Uh, you know, we actually struggled a lot with, you know, when, when do you optimize versus when do you, uh, you know, like, like, do you do a bunch of bit star because, you know, each optimization is relatively expensive, mm -hmm. um, or do you, and so we ended up with this alternating scheme, which works okay. Um, but, uh, I think this is not the last last of it. So I mean, there's more to do there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good message to leave off on is this progression of these algorithms is continuing. It hasn't just stopped. Um, they are getting better and better and substantially better too. these improvements. Yeah, are there any other comments or questions before we kind of transition? Yeah, quick question. Um, so with informed RRT star um, and bit star and, and the derivatives of that, um, so do you lose um, any optimality guarantees when you have obstacles and, and you're, and you're, you're shrinking, um, like you have the ellipsoid shrinking your like search area because you could potentially be cutting off the area that has the optimal path. 
So from what I understand, in these cases, um, I think, I don't know if this is defined to where you're doing shortest distance. Again, I'm not a, like expert on this fast, and I have more comments. Um, but I believe that ellipsoid does encompass any potential solution that has, uh, that is better, lower cost. Um, and they have proofs on that. Again, I don't know what the stipulations are. Um, but, so it basically comes down to the same thing as A star. Right, like where you have your your heuristic, so so essentially what bounds this this ellipsoid is is what the cost to go versus cost so far is, and so uh, it's, so the assumption is that that solution lies in that ellipsoid. So if that is not the case, then you would cut it off. But uh, basically, as long as you have a valid heuristic, it should be correct. Now, if the ellipsoid, right, so the question is then if you have a more complex heuristic in search space and so on, uh, then it's probably not just the ellipsoid anymore, or it, it will be a more complex limit. Hi, Brady. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask a silly question. So, what, uh, how people come up with the names of these <laughs> algorithms? What does the star mean? So I think it, I, that was actually a question I had. I believe star is for optimality. Is that correct? Yes. Um, yes. yes. Star okay. means optimal. That's what I believe. Yeah. It means that they find an optimal solution. Right. So RT is not optimal. <laughs> and it was known not to be optimal. But RT star is. And actually, the, the optimality for RT star was a little subtle. It's not straight yeah. up optimal. It's, eventually likely whatever hi brady i have a quick question about planning in general so you mentioned that um bit star fails for like certain cases like with narrow passages has there any been any work done with like combining sort of like terrain analysis with like planning strategy so like you could tell like there is a narrow passage and like use that to inform the planner yeah, I think that's the idea behind rapid star is sort of to, because it's taking that obstacle gradient, so it's informing it to say, yeah, maybe if you just need to nudge your path slightly, it would then work. Because um, otherwise, they don't know that that terrain info is not in the sampler. Um, and I think there are other cases where they do some other type of informed sampling. I think I've seen work where they try to train like a model to sample in a different way based on the obstacles. Uh, yeah, just to extend what Brady said here uh, on the question, uh, there has been some recent work from Berkeley on uh, using uh, CVA, so that is a conditional variation autoencoders uh, that basically encode uh, domain information in the planner. So now what you have is basically a given environment, uh, the machine learning algorithm will tell you where possibly a gap may lie. And because you know where it may lie, you can increase your sample efficiency on those areas. So there has definitely been some domain specific work. Right, and then basically, like uh, Brady mentions, you can change the sampling, right? Like you could essentially sample such that you are likely to find samples in uh, essentially inform the sampling so that you know that there's narrow passage and the extra sample in those. Um, and, uh, you know, like we mentioned before, like essentially uh, the methods, except if you combine them with chomp, are zero of order, right? Like you basically take a guess if it's good or not, and then you and then you connect it, and so you don't have a lot of domain information in there. And so if you can add that in, that can really help. Right. Okay. Uh, so yeah, now that uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Brady, for telling us about all the fun acronyms there. Uh, there is definitely a lot of puns when you read the paper. I think Rabbit Star has a place where they are gonna chomp on the bits. So it's it's all fun. Uh, but yeah, uh, with all these algorithms in there, it, it kind of becomes difficult for researchers to uh, you know, have all the algorithms implemented on their own end. And uh, whenever, you know, say you are going to build a new planner, I don't know, air lab expansion trees, whatever. So you definitely need to have a common benchmark or a common library that you can, you know, uh, pit your planner against so that you know, uh, and you can easily and quickly uh, benchmark your planner. So uh, that's where uh, the open motion planning library comes in. Uh, MPL has been used in the lab uh, since a long time. Uh, and we are kind of right now on the latest version here. Uh, the good thing about OMPL is uh, it contains uh, abstracted implementations of, of all these state-of-the-art planners. Uh, 
state of the art sampling based planners uh, more specifically uh, they don't have uh, algorithms for graph based planners uh, as such uh, the good thing about it uh, is that because it is widely used by both industry and academia uh, the progress is pretty rapid so for example if you have a paper uh, for example abit star came in 2020 abit star is already already has an implementation in OMPL. so you can just directly go on OMPL, uh, pick up that planner and you know kind of use it as a black box initially to you know kind of just go ahead and uh, run stuff uh, the good thing is about uh, the good and the bad thing about MPL is because it is abstracted, uh, it is domain independent, so it doesn't really matter if you are running it uh, for manipulation or you know you are flying drones with it or you are flying uh, or you are running like drone robots with it. Uh, you can always users can always provide uh, a domain specific uh, implementation. Uh, it is in C++, uh, so that you know uh, it is fast enough, uh, but it definitely has Python bindings. Uh, to make it easier to test, uh, so that's that's kind of good. Uh, as I mentioned before, it is good for uh, benchmarking. So once you have the setup ready, uh, it's really really, and we will try that in the tutorial as well. Uh, it's it's really really easy to change planners and play between them, and you know, kind of see their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, it is maintained by the Department of Computer Science at Rice, uh, so that's the Carver. Uh, Kavraki lab uh, and it's it's pretty good. Uh, uh, also, uh, just a quick disclaimer here: we won't be going into like the nitty gritties of the code base. It's kind of big. Uh, we'll we'll be uh, specifically focusing on uh, modules in the library that are useful in the lab and that are uh, more specific to aerial robotics in general. Thank you. Okay, uh, so that's the overview of OMPL. Uh, uh, yeah, as I said, it's. Uh, it, it gets a little uh, involved once you get into it, but uh, it, it's, it's pretty easy and we, I will just walk you through this and uh, we should be fine here. Um, as we said, uh, we won't be covering um, like the whole of it, uh, especially we won't be covering the top left corner there. Uh, so uh, when we talk about uh, planning in general or uh, sampling based planning in general, there are two uh, main branches. So one is geometric planning and one is control based planning. Uh, the difference being in geometric planning, you are uh, sampling directly from the state space, whereas in control planning, you're sampling in the control space. So rather than sampling an XYZ location, what you end up sampling is, okay, what's my acceleration that will take me to that, uh, what's my acceleration? And then based on that sampled accelerations, then you have parts. Uh, so we won't be covering that section, but uh, you know, you're free to, uh, there's also a lot of research going on in that section. Uh, a lot of earlier keynote dynamic work, uh, that's basically, you know, planning with differential constraints uh, was done using control-based sampling. So uh, algorithms like SST and you know, all that other stuff exists, uh, but that's for a uh, different day. Uh, okay, uh, next slide, please. So uh, first we'll be focusing on uh, the state space itself. Uh, here the state space refers to uh, the playground uh, where the robot would operate. So you know, uh, what kind of states, and this is where you know the domain specificities start coming into the system. So for a, a manipulation kind of thing, your uh, state space is basically the angles of the uh, robot, or for the uh, UGV, it might be you know, the XY location. So uh, OMPL uh, relies on this uh, thing where you're gonna, you could put in any state space and the planner would still run. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, OMPL uh, has a general case. So it has some state spaces that are already implemented in there. Uh, so uh, here are here's the complete uh, list of uh, what they have right now. Uh, the first one is pretty easy. Uh, it's uh, just real vector space. So Rn like R2, R3. So you got X, XY, XYZ, XYZ, whatever. Uh, it's uh, it's really useful to uh, do like simple planning there. Uh, the second is uh, the SO2 and SO3 spaces. Uh, so I won't go into the details of group theory here, but uh, SO2 refers to basically, uh, that's the special orthogonal group. Uh, special orthogonal group two uh, refers to uh, your angle. So it's basically just zero to uh, two pi. Uh, SO3, uh, and there are some other rules to it, uh, I won't get into that. Uh, SO3 basically now refers to your uh, uh, rotation in 3D space. So you now got roll pitch yaw. Uh, combine SO2 with R2 and what you get is SE2. So SE2 is X, Y, and yaw. Uh, SE3 basically brings in the whole thing where you get a whole six drop system. So again, that's a special, and those are the special Euclidean groups. Uh, there is definitely time and uh, there is uh, Dubin's and read shape. Uh, many people are aware of Dubin's, uh, although I'll just uh, put it out there. So Dubin's basically uh, is a path uh, that say you have a, constrained turn radius on a vehicle. Uh, and you'll see this very common in you know, self-driving cars and stuff like that. It's a, uh, imagine a car that can only turn at a certain radius, right? And you need to go from point A to point B. So you can always be like, you know, I'm gonna take a turn in the direction 
I'm going to go straight and then I'm again going to take a turn. So this turn state, turn strategy is what basically uh, WSS does. And it is optimal uh, in that sense. Uh, read shape is basically a one step up from WSS where now you can also take the card in reverse. So the figure on the right shows the difference between you know, going from point A to point B. Uh, uh, using a double uh, shape curve and a reach shape. Uh, usually with aerial vehicles, we do not do reach shape. Uh, we basically only focus on double because well, uh, it's kind of weird to you know take things in reverse uh, with aerial vehicles. Um, oops, right, next slide, please. Uh, so for our case, uh, the lab uh, uses a specific state space operating. Now, we don't fit in any of them really uh, because you, know, you can plan in SE3 space uh, but you know, wh why do you want to plan in though? Because of the differential, uh, because of the differential flatness of most of the system that we operate in, our role is usually coupled with, uh, almost like the roll and pitch are usually coupled uh, with the motion itself. So you know, we don't want to plan in roll and pitch. I mean, uh, as technologies progress and you know, we have actually uh, quad rotors that can operate in uh, six raw space, then you know, we might start thinking about in that direction. But currently we use uh, XYZ and Psi uh, as safe space. And that, that's going to be our primary state space uh, in the lab, although you know everything is again open for interpretation. Uh, as I said, it's a good assumption given the fact that the UAVs are differentially flat, uh, so uh, that kind of makes uh, sense. Uh, the good thing about OMPL is it allows you to construct your own state space uh, by combining the currently implemented state space, or you could uh, even start from scratch. But uh, we basically use uh, we take two state spaces or two or three state spaces that we want and combine them. Uh, in this specific case, we are going to combine the R3 state space, so that's the XYZ. And we are, we are going to combine that with SO2. So that gives us the XYZ size state space. And the implementation is, uh, is kind of the work that the lab did. Right, uh, next slide. Right, uh, so once now we have the state space, uh, another thing that the uh, a planning algorithm needs is to know if a particular state is valid. Uh, and uh, that, that's kind of important because that gives, us, gives the planner an idea of uh, where the obstacles lie. So if you can check, okay, if this specific state, uh, is it an obstacle or not? Uh, is it within an obstacle or not? Or how far it is from an obstacle? That kind of you know, uh, helps the situation. Uh, this uh, level also provides a uh, level of uh, abstraction on the kind of planning, uh, on the kind of mapping representation that you have. So you, know, you could have one, one cloud, or you could have disparity maps, or you could have like octo maps, it doesn't really matter. Uh, as long as the validity checker is basically it's a bool function that returns that okay, given a state is the state valid or not. Uh, doesn't matter where the validity comes from. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, currently, implement uh, currently uh, the way uh, OMPL wants you to do is basically uh, you need to provide uh, two things. Uh, first is a boolean that determines, as I said, if a particular state is valid. So if a state is inside an obstacle, you just say that okay that state is invalid. If it is uh, in a valid phase and you say that it's valid. Uh, another thing that you can give OMPL is the ability to check motion validation. Uh, basically motion validation is uh, say you have a path that is now connecting two points. Uh, you can tell OMPL whether that path goes through an obstacle or not. And uh, the freedom there is, I mean, you could definitely use uh, the state validity checking uh, to build a motion validity checking. And the easiest thing to do is basically, you know, discretize the path and check for each of the uh, states in the path. Uh, that works out, uh, but but many of the times, you know, it doesn't. Or you know, your discretization can be a function of a lot of things. So you know, there, it's, it's always good to have that freedom. But by default, uh, you know, you don't necessarily need to supply a motion validity checker, but you definitely need to supply a state validity checker because you know that kind of brings in your map uh, into the planning framework. And yeah, uh, please stop me at any point if uh, any of things uh, things need like more clarification and stuff like that. Right, uh, so. Uh, Currently, the lab has integration with CoStacks map representations. Uh, so we also have an Octomap representation as part of CoStacks. Uh, and the support for that in OMPL is already there. And uh, that's what you will see in the tutorial as well. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, state validity checking is mandatory. Uh, and uh, with uh, Octomap and stuff like that, it's pretty easy because you can just go ahead and check the uh, probability and you just attach a threshold to it. Like if the uh, cell is occupied with the probability say greater than 0.7, you just say that it's occupied and, and uh, uh, use that uh, to move forward. Uh, uh, the tutorial will have both the default motion validity checking and we'll also implement a, uh, our uh, version of a motion validity checker that is more specific to uh, ADL vehicles. Next slide. 
Cool. Uh, so once we have the state space and once we have a method to you know, uh, check the validity of your state, uh, next important thing is definitely the optimization. Uh, so what are you trying to reduce? Uh, one of the easiest thing uh, to notice is, is uh, you know, you, you can either be a single objective or a multi-objective and we'll talk about those uh, details as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, so yeah, uh, as a general case, uh, OMPL already has a, a few predefined objectives which make your life a little easier. Uh, one of the most obvious being uh, the path length objective, uh, you know, reduce the path length going from point A to point B, and that's definitely there. Uh, one other common thing that you'll see in uh, most robotics application is a minimum path clearance. Uh, it is really important, so you know, what you're trying to do is staying away from obstacles, uh, and you're trying to optimize staying away from obstacles. Uh, so that, that's kind of good. Uh, there is also a general framework for uh, getting a state cost integral. Uh, basically, what you do is rather than you know uh, giving a cost for a path, uh, you are giving the cost for a state being at a location. So you know uh, the way we talk about you know say the same thing could be implemented with distance transforms where you know you have a cost at a point. Uh, you basically take the point and you along the path you are just integrating uh, the cost of each of the state and then you get a total cost. Uh, there is also the mechanical work uh, which is pretty useful, uh, although. Uh, there's a uh, little less working there in the lab as well. Uh, as usual, a custom objective function uh, can also be implemented. Uh, ideally, it should return a double given a path. Uh, that's, that's the usual way uh, it works. So you can now define, and this kind of opens up uh, the whole uh, situation to you know using fun functions like you know minimizing energy, uh, minimizing time, whatever, uh, whatever suits your fancy that can always be used there. Uh, this is also the place where you can supply uh, the, the heuristics. Uh, so, you know, both state to state and state to goal heuristics can be specified as part of the objective function. Uh, so, you know, uh, if you have, say, a more informed heuristic, for example, a lot of uh, path planning algorithms, a lot of uh, dynamics based uh, UAV path planning algorithms use Devon's path as a heuristic. So, you know, this is where you can actually uh, put in that heuristic to make the planner faster, uh, provided that the heuristic is valid. Uh, uh, the one drawback of this whole approach is there is limited support for multi-objective functions. Uh, I mean, the only kind of support that exists is you can make a weighted sum, uh, and you need to, you know, kind of decide the weights that okay. Say you want to, you know, minimize the path length, but also you know have a, a maximize. Uh, you also want to maximize your path clearance, so, and you can just put a weighted sum on both of these, and uh, you can construct those things. Uh, but uh, as I said, it it doesn't. It, it requires a bit of tuning on your end to make it really specific. So uh, that support is definitely lacking. Also, there is no specific min-max support. Uh, and that can, you know, uh, makes uh, supporting multi-objective functions. So, so that's definitely a uh, place where OMPL can uh, improve in the future, I suppose. Next one. Uh, cool. Uh, in our case, uh, our focus for the tutorial would definitely be path length. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, different things exist. Uh, Basti already talked about smoothness uh, for Chomp. Uh, so that's definitely a nice thing. Uh, we also like path clearance, as I said. Uh, we like time and uh, energy is also something that uh, we have been recently working on as because uh, energy most of the time is not directly a function of your time or uh, your path length. So there's definitely some nonlinearity there which can be exploited to you know, actually have more energy efficient paths. Uh, so that was also uh, something that uh, we are interested in building in MPL. Cool. Uh, so uh, right. Uh, on the right there is basically some things that we would kind of you know gloss over. Uh, I don't want to go into details on most of these things, uh, but we'll kind of just uh, touch on them. Uh, they you did not necessarily implement them to run a planner, uh, but we have implementations in the lab uh, that you know make our life a little easier on these. Uh, but uh, as a vanilla MPL uh, implementation, you don't necessarily need things on the right. Hey, uh, so goals is, uh, I mean, I'm just going to touch over these. Uh, so goals in OMPL can be defined as, you know, basically a point goal where you are like, okay, take me to whatever X, Y, Z, Psi. Uh, or you could uh, in turn also define a goal region uh, where you're like, okay, I'm going to define this region. And if, if now I'm close to this region, I'm like, okay, the planner is solved. Uh, as again, a custom class can be defined to, you know, whatever a goal condition that you want to define. And uh, these things uh, really help in like a uh, implementation perspective. Uh, the path in general, OMPL has its own representation for paths. Uh, 
the I mean, it, it, the basic method is nice enough. Uh, it supports, you know, uh, usual functions like, you know, append to the path or you know, interpolate on the path, uh, remove states from the path, read states from the path. Uh, sad thing is, uh, because OMPL is abstract, it doesn't provide you a visualization support. Uh, so that is something, you know, that uh, we need to write on our own end. But uh, we, we have some stuff for that. Uh, we have our own apprentices, uh, Sanjeev and Soul work, uh, where we also have implementations for our paths as well. Uh, that you are specifically x y z psi and you know have other uh, methods over them that are really useful say you know for example you're uh, planning in x y z and all you want is your uh, side to always point to the next point uh, so you know you that tangential uh, construction you know and methods like that are definitely there plus you know we have our visualization tools to stay with that as well uh, some things we won't cover uh, are uh, state uh, samplers uh, um, you know, uh, everybody keeps referring to the fact that, you know, you, you sample from the state space, but uh, well, how do you sample from the state space? Where do you sample from the state space? Uh, so there is also, you know, uh, the whole informed sampling part of it where, you know, as I mentioned, uh, say you want to uh, uh, get a CVA based sampler on it or something like some, some, some fancy sampler that you're working on. So you can definitely, you know, put that into it and uh, check uh, how the algorithm performs with it. Um, I, uh, termination conditions can also be specified. So, you know, that basically, as you know, uh, Terry mentioned that, uh, the longer you run these planners, the better the guarantees get. So, you know, for example, all the, all the suggested planners are asymptotically optimal, uh, which means that the longer you run them, the better the solution gets. Uh, so, you know, you can definitely, the termination condition is then usually specified in, okay, I'm going to run this thing for like a hundred seconds and see what it gets. Uh, you, you could also specify other, or a combination of termination conditions. So you could be like, okay, what's what's the maximum number of iterations that I can uh, run this thing? Or, uh, you know, it's either the max of either run for these many iterations or I run for this much time. Also, all those things can be specified. Uh, as I said, we're not gonna cover planning in control space, uh, but uh, we're definitely uh, feel free to explore it out as well. Uh, so just an overview of how all of these things come together. Uh, so there are two important uh, things in here. One uh, a thing is called a space information class. So uh, the space information class is the class that basically takes in everything and you know uh, has the whole space. Uh, so you can just query the space information class to get whatever. So the state space goes in there, the motion validator goes in there, the uh, sampler goes in there, uh, the validity checker goes in there. It basically all the information that the planner needs uh, when it comes to state uh, is kind of put into that whole uh, space information box. So consider it as a, you know, a box that has all of the things that you need. Uh, and next slide, please. And the second important thing is the problem definition itself. Uh, the problem definition basically has uh, information related to solving a specific problem. So you know that has your, okay, what's my start location? What's my goal location? What kind of path representation am I looking at? And what am I you know, optimizing? Uh, the good thing is because these two things are separate, you can always you know keep the first thing constant and you can always use the second thing to uh, kind of keep changing your plan or, you know, uh, run like a Monte Carlo or whatever on it that, you know, pick a random start goal and just keep running it, keep running it and batch model. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of nice there. Cool. Uh, so yeah, uh, now that we know uh, everything, uh, the idea is to uh, build a small planning instance. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick break here. And uh, if anybody has any questions on uh, OMPL in general, uh, we can ask. Does the OMPL have support for um, multi heuristics, or is that something you would have to implement yourself? Uh, no, it doesn't support multi heuristics. It just supports single heuristics. Uh, actually, surprisingly, multi heuristic research hasn't picked up in sampling based planners. Uh, it's more towards graph based planners. Uh, so, yeah, that, it doesn't support it for now. Okay, cool. Uh, go ahead and let's. So, so, the idea is to now build a planning instance. Uh, so, I'm just going to you know, run step by step, and these are the kind of steps that you'll see in the tutorial as well. Uh, so, you know, uh, just kind of gives you a uniform idea of uh, what we're looking for. Uh, so, uh, to the two planning, the two namespaces that would essentially be operating in while uh, using OMPL is the OMPL base uh, namespace and the OMPL geometric namespace. Uh, so, the base has uh, all the usual things uh, that are common across geometric and control based planners. Uh, so, you've got, you know, specifying your goals specifying objectives, getting your samplers, uh, spaces, termination conditions, and all that stuff is in the base. Uh, geometric section basically has the geometric planners and you know, paths and stuff like that. Uh, so when, whenever we are importing stuff from these, uh, you, you, you'll see the OG and OB things like keep popping up everywhere. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the second step would be you know, getting your state validity checker. Um, 
ideally you can just implement it right then and there uh, you know import whatever map that you have uh, and based on the map you can just implement a small thing where you know, it goes ahead looks up in the map where the state is and gives a valid non valid uh, so that's uh, another thing that uh, we'll be needing in the tutorial today uh, step three is where we actually start uh, the planning. Uh, the first thing definitely is to uh, kind of know, okay, what's what declare what your state space is. So, for example, in this case, you see that you know we are declaring uh, everything is in C plus plus eleven by the way, so it's it's kind of nice and easy. Um, uh, in this case, you're uh, specifically telling, okay, I'm going to use my AC three state space, which is going to import that state space. Everything is like nice and templated, so uh, makes it uh, easy to use. Uh, you get that state space and you declare that, okay, that's going to be my space. Uh, once you have the space, uh, then it's up to you to declare the bounds on the space. Uh, so, uh, for example, you know, for in this specific case, uh, because it's a C3, so you got XYZ. So you're going to define three bounds on it. Uh, you're going to set the high, so that's going to be the, the larger extent on your bound, and you're going to set the low on the bound. So that kind of gives you a box uh, within which the planner would operate. And this can be independent of your map. So uh, even if you have a huge map and you just want to plan in a small space, you can always uh, use a smaller uh, bound there. Once you have the bounds, it's basically set the, tell the space that, okay, that's my space and that's the bounds on my space. So that's it's kind of nice. Uh, once you have the space and you know you have the validity checker and everything, then you can actually start building your space information class. Uh, so the space information class is you just basically declare the whole thing and you just add, okay, that's the space that I'm going to use. And it's going to uh, give you that part. Once you have it, you just supply it with whatever validity checker or any other thing that you want to add uh, in that uh, space information class. And uh, that will like, kind of hold the whole thing together. Uh, once you have time to get your start and goal states, uh, so uh, scope state is what is usually used to start and go uh, to define the start and goal. Uh, so uh, here in this specific case, we are just going to get a random uh, start and a random goal state. Uh, I think in tutorial you have like a defined start and goal state, making things a little bit easier. And once you have that, then it's time to construct your problem definition. You declare that uh, using your space information pointer so that you know, uh, everything is connected. Uh, once you have the problem definition, you basically supply your start and goal state to the problem definition, and uh, that's kind of it. Your, your problem is now uh, kind of set up. Uh, once you have the problem set up, it's now time to bring in the planner. Uh, so as I mentioned, it, it's very easy in you know, MPL to switch between planners. So as you see, uh, you, you just need to basically tell, okay, that is the plan that I'm going to use. Uh, if you have your own planner implementation, you can definitely you know, bring it uh, in here at this point, or you can use one of the stock uh, available planners. Uh, so right now, this is our RIT connect uh, that we are uh, just showing you for an example here. You remove the connect, that's going to be our RIT. You add star there, that's going to be it. Uh, if you want to have a list, uh, Lady and I will probably post a link uh, on the OMPL list of planners that is available. Uh, and if you want the actual name uh, that goes in there, you can definitely go into the OMPL code base and uh, look that up. Uh, it's everything is going to be under uh, geometric. You go into geometric, you're going to get planners, and that's going to have the list. Um, so, and, and we'll we'll help you out with uh, looking up planners as well. Uh, so once you have the planner, you basically tell the planner that okay, that's my problem. The problem already has the space information, so you don't need to tell anything else. Uh, and just to make sure that everything runs, we run a planner setup stage. Uh, the setup basically checks uh, that everything that you have supplied makes sense. Uh, this step will throw you an error. If, if you have made any configurational errors somewhere that are really obvious, uh, the planner setup will tell you that, okay, you know, you kind of messed up there. And just go ahead and correct that. And uh, that this is like a check uh, before you actually run the planner that everything works out. Uh, well, now you have everything. So you basically go and uh, ask the planner to solve. Uh, single line, uh, it's nice. Uh, the parentheses, uh, so the uh, arguments that you give by default is the time uh, for termination, uh, but any other termination condition that you can think of uh, can be uh, put in like at this stage uh, in the plan. Cool. Uh, once the planner finishes, uh, then you can always, you know, uh, then you can essentially do whatever. Uh, usually, you know, we send it to our ways to visualize or, you know, you can send it to a lower level controller that is actually going to execute the plan. Uh, so this is the part where, you know, we usually send it down to the core stacks uh, stuff where now the core stack has a global plan and, you know, it executes whatever local planning and uh, things that it has to do. Uh, here is also where you can save the plans. Uh, you can interpolate, you can, uh, you know, uh, run checks. Okay, how good is my plan? Is my plan actually, you know, clear of obstacles and stuff like that. So all that post-processing can be uh, done in this section. Cool. Uh, I guess Brady uh, can take over here uh, to you know uh, 
set up the planning instance. I think we already have the tutorial up already. Yeah, so what you'll do is you'll go to this link. Um, hopefully you've already set up the workspace. Um, what we've done is we've taken out just some lines of code in the planning tutorial.cpp. Um, and what you'll do is you'll go down to these lines of code and it'll say on it what slide to reference that Jay just talked about and you'll just implement the planner. It's like four or five lines of code. Um, wow. Right off the bat, the code should build. So you can build the code and check it, but it won't actually output a path. And then you'll go change these things, rebuild the code, and it should work. Yeah. And then you can go through, and we have some exercises on there to just kind of explore OMPL, change some things. Um, there is also an, an advanced section, which just uses um, Dubin's KBit star, I believe. Sorry, Jay. Mm -hmm. um, and on there, again, you can kind of explore. Um, so what we'll do, though, is like at the end of 20 minutes, we'll send out the lines of code if you haven't figured it out. Or if you want, you can always just ask us if you've tried it and just want the answer. So. Yes, uh, when you download the, there is a dot repos file in there, so we use VCS, I think, to get it. Uh, if you're going to download the repo on your own, make sure that it's uh, uh, checked out to the correct branch. Uh, everything has its own uh, specific branch. Uh, so if your branch is not correct, it won't build. Uh, so yeah, just, just make sure that the branch is correct. Okay, so I started screen sharing um, the results for this is for the advanced Dubin's branch. Um, right now you can see it's running on the left and it's found a solution and it's just refined that solution. Um, this one by default runs for a minute, takes a lot longer. Um, when it finishes, you should see the results on the right. Okay, hey, uh, I think uh, we are near the uh, end of our tutorial today. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, we'll uh, leave the repo out. Uh, feel free to play around with it. And uh, Vidya and I will always be available uh, in case you guys have any questions at some point. And uh, yeah, hopefully this uh, helps uh, jumpstart uh, OMPL stuff in the lab as well. Hey, cool. Okay, uh, thank you so much, guys. <laughs>